Hungary's relationship with the EU has been so enormously complicated that it has earned the country the title of the EU's troublemaker. On the one hand, the country is a full member of the EU, which also means it enjoys full benefits of membership. But on the other hand, Hungary's leader, Viktor Orban, has been unrelenting in his hostile rhetoric against the European Union. He has been attacking the EU's officials, has been ignoring the EU's fundamental values, and has regularly undermined the EU's unity in matters such as help to war-torn Ukraine. This has repeatedly plunged the Union into uncertainty, with leaders rushing to persuade Orban to lift his objections last minute. As we've explained elsewhere, the EU has to be unanimous on key issues, which also means that destroying its unity is quite easy. It just takes one member state. Case in point, just hours ago, Orban threatened to scupper the EU's plan to provide 50 billion euros in aid to Ukraine. Not providing the aid would have almost certainly been crippling to Ukraine's economy. However, at the extraordinary EU summit, Orban finally agreed to the financial aid to Ukraine together with all remaining 26 EU member states. Given all that, is Hungary really the EU's troublemaker? Or has Viktor Orban merely outsmarted the EU at its own game of diplomacy by playing hardball? Let's find out. I'm Jan with Prague Pulse and this is the story of how the clash between Orban Hungary on the one hand and the EU on the other hand has evolved over time and what's at stake for the future. But first, we have to take a quick trip to history and explain how Viktor Orban has become such a dominant force both in domestic and European politics. That will then help us understand what exactly is going on today. While studying law at university, Orban, together with a group of young liberals, founded the Alliance of Young Democrats, Fidesz for short. And as you probably know, later Fidesz would become the absolute hegemon of Hungarian politics. At first, Orban was a champion of liberal reforms and opposed any populist, nationalist or even anti-Semitic undercurrents that appeared in the first post-communist government in Hungary. This quickly made him the most popular politician in the country and quickly catapulted him into the position of president of Fidesz at only 30 years of age in 1993. However, after the humiliating defeat in the 1984 election, the still liberal Orban began to shift to the right quite dramatically. Suddenly, Orban started to talk a lot more about the nation, national interests, protecting the national interests, family, and love for the home country. And simply because he believed that doing so would win him more votes, he started attacking the so-called liberal elite, including the Hungarian-born investor George Soros, who coincidentally funded Orban's own studies at Oxford University just a few years before. So as you clearly see, Orban is not really ideological. Rather, his actions are the result of clever calculations that aim to maximize his own gain. That is pretty precisely why he has gone from the liberal driving force behind the revolution that brought down communism in Hungary in 1989, all the way to the conservative mastermind that he is today. And it is precisely this political shrewdness that we must consider to be able to fully comprehend his difficult relationship with the EU today. With that out of the way, what exactly are the pain points in the relationship between Orbán's Hungary and the EU? Well, there have been many. For one, Orbán has faced harsh criticism for violating the rule of law in Hungary. In 2010, he managed to win a supermajority of votes in the election, meaning two-thirds of all seats in the Hungarian parliament. With that, he quickly rushed through an entirely new constitution of the country. The whole process of adopting a new constitution, which would normally take months if not years, took the party nine days. No input from the public was allowed, much less a referendum, which is in itself quite problematic given how important an entirely new constitution is, of course. The main target of the constitution were the courts, whose autonomy Orban seriously curtailed. First, Orban made sure that justices of the new constitutional court would have to be elected by two-thirds of Hungarian MPs and not by a committee composed of representatives of 
all political parties, as it was the case under the old constitution. Plus, Fidesz added an entirely new provision saying that laws cannot be annulled by the constitutional court if they have been passed by a two-thirds majority of the votes in parliament. And in some matters, such as budgetary laws, the court is now not allowed to adjudicate at all. What's the problem with that? Well, Fidesz and Fidesz alone has held the two-thirds majority for the past 14 years. More importantly, not allowing a constitutional court to annul laws that it considers illegal is certainly not standard in a democracy. Constitutional courts should be free to review all laws without exception, as that helps to prevent any wrongdoings by the governing majority. The result of all this is that the Hungarian constitutional court is no no longer independent and Fidesz is now free to pass pretty much any law it wants, including altering the constitution itself or altering the election rules. Naturally, Orban has used this opportunity amply. Election rules in Hungary have been changed to give much more weight to traditionally Fidesz-leaning districts, a practice called gerrymandering in the United States. Plus, the winner of an election now systematically gets many more seats than would correspond to the party's vote share. So, Fidesz has made it significantly easier for the party to win an election in the future and when it does it has made sure that it wins enough seats to win a constitutional majority of two-thirds of the seats again it doesn't stop there though orban has also attacked independent media and the civil society he has now centralized most of the country's media in one giant government controlled media holding which comprises more than 400 media outlets so directly or indirectly fides controls more than 80% of all media outlets in Hungary. That all means that while there is officially no censorship in Hungary, there really doesn't have to be any, because it is difficult for the opposition anyway to reach any kind of audience. As an example, in the run-up to the 2022 general election, which Fidesz dominated again, the opposition was given only a total of five minutes to make their case on state-controlled media. And that's of course a problem, because still, about one-third of the country's electorate only relies on state-controlled media as their source of information, and that means that that one-third of the electorate, which is many people, is basically left at the mercy of government propaganda. To top it all off, Fidesz has been skillfully fanning fears and frustrations in the society, which now has a much more difficult time fact-checking information given the media capture that we've just explained. For instance, at the height of the migrant crisis in 2015, Orban claimed that the EU wanted to build migrant ghettos in Hungary which was never the case. Or, more recently, he implied that EU sanctions against Russia don't work by putting up billboards all around the country with a bomb about to detonate. This all serves a clear purpose to scare the electorate, cement support for Fidesz, and increase the likelihood that the party remains in power in the future. This poses a serious conundrum for the EU. You see, nothing that Viktor Orban has done has been illegal strictly speaking. Yes, he has changed the constitution and he has made the courts dysfunctional, but that was only possible because he had managed to win the 2010 election, which was democratic and largely free and fair. This creates what the sociologist Kim Lane Chappelle called autocratic legalism. Orban did not need to openly violate rules and regulations, it was enough for him to legally change the laws to his liking, because he has effectively eliminated all checks and balances to his power by emasculating the constitutional court. His laws are still technically upheld because there is no one to declare with authority whether or not the laws are legal. Yes, the constitutional court in Hungary still technically exists, but it doesn't serve its purpose. 
As a result, the spirit of democracy in Hungary slowly dies, although democracy remains strong on paper and Hungary is still, on paper, a democratic member state of the European Union. Unfortunately for the EU, it is quite limited in what it can do to truly compel member states to uphold not only democracy on paper, but also the spirit of democracy. To a limited extent, the EU can and has done use funds as a tool to rein in Hungary. Mind you, the country remains the biggest recipient of funds from the EU budget per capita. Between 2014 and 2021 alone, Hungary received more than 40 billion euros from the EU budget, which makes up around 5% of the country's total GDP. That means that Hungary is very dependent on the influx of EU money and hypothetically, Restricting that influx could deal a serious blow to the regime. Some economists even say that without the EU and the benefits of EU membership, the Hungarian economy would collapse entirely. That was why in 2022, the EU actually decided to freeze more than 22 billion euros due to Hungary, citing rule of law violations in the country as the reason. More than 11 billion of that money still remains frozen today. The obvious problem is that doing so actually presents dangers to the EU itself. At the very least, it gives Hungary even more ammunition to use against the EU in its propaganda. And because a single member state is enough to block agreement on important policy issues such as aid to Ukraine, it also gives Hungary significant blackmailing power actually brings us back to today. Hungary has been staunchly opposed to providing any sort of aid to Ukraine, be it economic or military. It has labeled sanctions against Russia harmful, openly declared that Ukraine has no chance of winning the war anyway, and routinely repeated Kremlin spread lies in its government-controlled media. Orban has even been the only Western leader to openly shake hands with Putin after the start of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. The problem is obvious. On the one hand, the EU clearly doesn't like the authoritarian tilt of its full-fledged member state, but it also needs Hungary to push through a hot agenda item such as providing more aid to Ukraine. Anger Orban too much? Then you can forget about your policy. Ignore Hungary's democratic backsliding? Then you're compromising on your core values and making the entire European project seem much less credible. This time, in the end, the EU did get Viktor Orban's green light and the EU did pass additional Ukraine aid. How? Given that Orban had promised that he would never agree to any additional aid to Ukraine. Well, maybe it was a bit of Giorgia Meloni's feminine charm. Maybe it was a bit of excellent French wine at the Alizé, and maybe it was a bit of both. Or maybe Orban has been playing a game to maximize his own gains as he has done so many times in the past, but this time he has actually overplayed his own hand. In any case, the success of the extraordinary EU summit on February 1st, 2024 is indeed an extraordinary feat of diplomacy, and it is certainly a perfect message for Ukraine. Still, it shows how incredibly fragile EU's unity can be if only one troublemaker is enough to destroy that unity. And it reminds us that the talk of a possible EU reform that would get rid or limit this veto power will most likely get even stronger in the future. However, Hungary is definitely not the only country that poses a challenge to the rest of the EU. So is Austria, which some claim has become the spinest of Europe. Be sure to check out our recent video that explains how that happened and whether or not there's a way forward. This has been Jan with Prague Pulse. See you next time.